This is the story of Harbor Publishing. It has given voice to a community, the people of the coast of British Columbia. And the world has stopped to listen. To understand Harbor Publishing and its founder, Howard White, is to understand how books are created, how an imaginative community is documented, and how a literary legacy is laid down. When I was a kid growing up here, uh, all the grown-ups ever told me was, look, go to school, get a good education, and you'll be able to get out of this place. You know, you'll be able to go off to the city, you won't be stuck here with all the rest of us. And that's really how I grew up thinking about uh, not only Pender Harbor, but the whole coast. You know, it was a place for loggers and fishermen and other losers. So my whole intention when I was there was that I was, you know, going to go off and be a great man in the world beyond. I certainly had no idea that I would ever return and certainly had even less of an idea that in my adult life I'd be looking back at those experiences I had as a kid and, and trying to relive them in my memory and write about them for the rest of the world. See a hole coming through there now, it's going to be all right. Oh yeah, what was it like out around the outside? Pretty clear out there. Yeah. Oh yeah. Maybe patches, we'll, of, patches of fog here and there, but clearing up, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Maybe we'll go poke our nose out there and take a look at it. Yeah, okay. As it happened, the, the uh, way I found to make a living was uh, publishing other people's writing, and that happened to put off my own efforts for a good uh, 10 to 15 years. Okay, let's go. I would hope that Harbor Publishing has succeeded in giving voice to uh, the coastal region of BC. I think I've been successful uh, to a degree that I never really expected. And people flock around, they say, oh yeah, you're the guy that did Raincoast Chronicles. Well, after I finished uh, UBC in 1970, I came back to Pender Harbor and started the community newspaper. Because here, you'd write something uh, late in the middle of the night. The next morning, it would be on the uh, streets of Pender Harbor. People would be reading it. And they'd either want to run up and hug you or punch your lights out. You know, and you were getting immediate response uh, for your, your writing effort. And uh, it was very exciting. Eventually, I came up with the idea that perhaps there was a possibility here for some kind of a, a publishing venture which would concentrate on feature material about the history of the BC coast. And uh, the thing that really uh, triggered it um, was the, uh, Trudeau with his OFY grants and his LIP grants. Um, these came out, I guess, in about 1971 or 72. I remember I, I applied for an OFY grant. Uh, I think I wanted something like $2,500 to start a magazine which would have articles about the coast. We didn't get that, but the next year they expanded that program and came up with the LIP grants. And uh, I then put together an application for a $12,000 grant uh, to do four issues of a magazine about BC coast history. Um, I really had no idea about the, the logistics of how you'd go about doing this, but uh, lo and behold, the grant was accepted. And uh, I, I got this amazing check in the mail for $12,000, which was more money than I'd ever seen. It's more money than my parents had ever seen in one lump before. I could scarcely believe it. Um, but then I was under the gun to, to go ahead and create this magazine and uh, uh, start being worthy of my hire. The fact that it was well packaged uh, gave Raincoast Chronicles um, a tremendous advantage over a lot of other things that were being done at that time and uh, uh, added to its success. So it, it, it had the right content, but without the right packaging it might never have happened. That still left sales. Um, after we sent the first issue off to the printer, uh, I went down to pick them up, and I was amazed at how big the pile of magazines was. I mean, 3,000 magazines makes quite a 
Vandy Heap in, in, uh, in the back of the truck. And uh, uh, driving them home, I remember thinking, Good God, I mean, I, I can see getting rid of maybe one or two boxes of these, but that'll cover everybody I know in the world. Who's going to get the rest? And uh, uh, I cogitated on this for a while, and then I decided, well, I guess the thing to do is to load them back in the truck and go back down to Vancouver and start going around to some of these bookstores. And... Uh, of course, the first bookstore that you go to in Vancouver is Duthie's. You know, I didn't know Bill Duthie, but everybody said, go see Bill Duthie, you know, he'll, he'll take care of you or whatever. So I went very trepidatiously in there with my, my sack full of, of this new book. Yeah, expecting you'll take five copies or yeah. something. Yeah. And he looked it all over and said, mm, 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 not bad, I'll take 100. You know, really? I thought, wow! This publishing business is great. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Now I'll go along to the next store and sell another hundred. You yeah. know, of course it took me three weeks to sell the second hundred, but, but he knew exactly what he was doing. You know, he knew exactly. He looked at me. He looked at what I was doing, and he thought, yeah. well, Bill you know, "These guys need kind of a stuff. vote of confidence." You know, I would load the truck up and I would go around to the stores myself after we'd published, printed up the book, and um, I would try and talk people into to buying them. Uh, personally from myself and uh, um, it was a good way to do it uh, it gave me a, an excellent feel for what the market really was it established from very early on a close relationship between Harbor Publishing and the actual stores who were selling the books and it gave me as the chief editor a uh, very good feeling of what people in the stores were buying and what they wanted when we first uh, realized we were in the magazine business, one of the first things I realized was that we needed a group of writers. Writing is, is not something that, that uh, we're just all born with. It's a skill which uh, is acquired through long effort. And um, uh, I made up for the first issue by uh, assiduously rewriting everything that was handed in to me. Uh, and uh, uh, getting by that way, uh, some of the people did good research, uh, but um, uh, I soon began to realize that unless I was going to write the whole damn magazine myself, I was going to have to find some other uh, writing talent. Well, I think always there were a good percentage of bloggers and fishermen that read, and you had to find these. These were your audience. I mean, the ones that didn't read, they were no use to anyway. But I know when I worked in the camps, I mean, a lot of guys would, would actually put you down for reading too much and stuff like this. I didn't dare tell them I wrote poetry. It would have been death. <laughs> so I went down uh, to Gibson's, uh, asked people where uh, I could find Pete Trower, and they'd say, what for? <laughs> his, his reputation amongst the local people there was sort of that... Uh, uh, here was a good logger who was wasting his time uh, scribbling away writing poetry. That was the whole thing behind the Chronicles, was, was creating a magazine that never existed before. There just never was a magazine like that before. So it was a completely new thing. It was sort of a cross between a historical magazine and a, and a literary magazine, which had certainly never been done. Now we actually had some money. We paid off the bills. And we realized for the first time that you could actually seriously think about making a living doing the kind of material we were doing. It was then that I got the idea of doing uh, Bus Griffith's book, Now You're Logging. There's been quite a few books come out about logging by people that have never spent a day of their life in the woods. And while they have some wonderful photographs, I mean, they, they show a bunch of guys sitting on the side of a machine, you know, and people look at it and they got, haven't got a clue what that machine's used for or what the fellas are there for or what they do, you know. I was intrigued with the way that Buss's cartoons were his attempt to uh, retell his experiences in, in the woods as a logger, but at the same time um, communicate the whole ambience, the whole atmosphere of the early logger and at the same time also show 
all the logging processes with great accuracy. And you can uh, plumb a tree to see the lean of it by uh, grabbing your axe handle and holding it out like this and the axe head acts like a plumb bob and you can see which way the tree leans. I think one of the books that I'm the most proud of doing because I know that that book has, A, it's really added something to uh, the body of literature about BC and B, if, if I hadn't been there to encourage Bus and to do the book, no one else would have. A lot of books come and you know that the, their shelf life is really six months and maybe another six months in paperback. Not Howie's. When Howie does a book, it's there for life. It, it's really an important part of British Columbia, therefore it's an important part of us and, and the people who come to the store. The big publishers are so uh, totally immersed in the blockbuster syndrome and they're paying uh, hundreds of thousand dollars advance to, to uh, writers who write what they think is the popular sort of thing, that the, the quiet writer who writes to just write a really good book that he wants to write and that isn't con without concern whether it's going to sell well when he's writing it. I mean, if you're, if you're writing just to sell, it's, it's a different kind of book. And uh, so I think all those people are going to have to turn to small, intimate publishers, of which Howie is, is one of the best. Howard did the book Fishing with John. And what a miracle that book was. Um, Edith came to do a, some promotion, and, and Edith did a fine job. She, she worked very, very hard on that tour. But it was astonishing, again, what that book did. I'm not sure that we've ever had a book in my 12 years quite like it. Um, it really did. She really focused on that life of, of a fisherman. And uh, I think captured uh, the art of being a fisherman. After John died, uh, Edith continued to live in the harbor, and uh, we became quite close friends. And uh, I think the first thing that I had her write for me was an article in Rainco's Chronicles on Muriel Blanchett, the author of Curve of Time. And uh, then she slowly began uh, putting her life back together after John's death. and, and um, uh, working on the book that later became Fishing with John, which is the story of her life uh, uh, with John Daly as, as a deckhand on his troller in the summers and, and so on. And um, I kind of uh, helped her along with that. I did everything I could to try and encourage her and uh, uh, assure her that it was worth doing. And I think at one point I even built a writing table for her because she was convinced that the thing that was holding her back was she didn't have a proper place to put her typewriter and so on. I did everything I could to bring the book along. He's always interested in anything that is uh, fresh and exciting about the history of BC and very, very open to uh, any new subject and not too concerned about whether the person is an experienced writer. That was simply uh, just an, an accident in my case that I had been, was a trained writer, but he has taken many people through the whole writing routine. But I think one of his, I think one of the great books and one of the great contributions to Canadian literature is Bill White's book. That's the first time I had ever read an honest, straight description of, of, the, of the whole labor situation, and I was totally fascinated. Looking back on it, uh, how did you feel about the whole process of doing it? I mean. Uh, well, I, Did I you enjoy it? Or? I enjoyed uh, uh, the book in as much as it put forth the way that I felt. I didn't, wasn't care, didn't care about uh, how, what people thought. I wanted to tell them exactly as it was. And uh, needless to say, I ruffled a lot of feathers. And... Of course, Jim Spilsbury uh, is another coastal old timer who had uh, written a few things in. in uh, little local papers on Savory Island, but uh, didn't think of himself as a writer at all. And uh, I got together with him oh, about 10 years ago now, and we did a few stories in Raincoast Chronicles, and uh, they went well. And uh, uh, then, of course, he and I later collaborated on two books, Spillsbury's Coast and The Accidental Airline. The amazing thing is that when I'd see it in almost finished form just to require check, final check before printing, 
I thought I'd written it. But then when I compared it with what I'd actually done, he'd, uh, without it appearing so, had more than edited, he'd rewritten parts of it. And here and there he would use uh, some phrase or terminology that I normally wouldn't use, and that'd give me the clue. Otherwise, he has that knack of being able to write in somebody else's hand. One of my beliefs has always been that if you could uh, somehow leap over that school conditioning and, and tap into the, the fluency and the ability that most good speakers have naturally with the language, you can somehow transpose that onto paper uh, with no loss of energy, character, and color. Because I was a trade journalist for Cool Inquire, um, I had been able to meet most of the publishers around here, certainly. And, uh, and so when I came to need to publish this book of interviews with authors, uh, after it was rejected by a couple of large companies back east, I thought, well, who should I see here? And uh, so I picked up the phone and how he answered the phone. And he said, yeah, he would publish it over the phone. And, and uh, I've maintained that closeness. I've d done five books with Howie since. And I like to have a publisher. You can pick up the phone, you dial the number, and the publisher answers. I think he's pretty shrewd about uh, uh, understanding what the public uh, deserves to get and, and, and may even wants. And so on that level, he's a very smart man. He knows how to communicate with the public. And a lot of publishers that maybe don't even have that sensibility. So he's really got a strong populist streak that makes him a good publisher in terms of deciding what books, you know, need to be done. And, uh, and also, because he really does respect writers, uh, being a writer himself, I think that gives him an advantage over a lot of publishers who aren't, who are strictly business people. My focus is on women in my stories. I don't think that betrays the very foundations of this country. I think that for far too long, our entire national fabric has been seen through the eyes of male characters written by male writers, all of whom seem to have lived on Brunswick Avenue in Toronto. And that is not, that's not the truth for everybody. And, and I know that a lot of the stuff Howard has published, my stuff that Howard has published, would not have been published somewhere else without enormous revisions really enormous revisions, which I probably would have made because you do what you have to do, right? It's no sense being a writer if you're not going to get published. But I would have resented having, having to make those revisions. Anne Cameron had written Daughters of Copper Woman. It became a classic book on the West Coast, but all the way through the United States. Wherever people could find that book, they read it and they told other people about it. And I was told by book distributors in the States that if they just hid more of Anne Cameron, it would, they, they could easily sell it. But for years, nothing happened until Howie took it on. I think he risks his shirt with everything that, that he puts out. And I think that he has put out stuff which is never going to make money. It's never going to pay for itself. But somebody had to get it down. We have already lost so much of our, our real history. He has found these people that, that really uh, are significant to our coast and uh, uh, given them a real life for us. He went to the people who knew the stories. He didn't, he didn't make the mistake of getting, for example, some aspiring writers in the city to go through the provincial archives and find some nugget and write a fictionalized whatever. He, he went to these places with the weird sounding names and he talked to these old farts with two fingers left on their hand from working in sawmills and, and got their stories. And I mean, obviously people wanted that. Raincoast Chronicles just sells out, whap. Um, I think now more and more writers are willing and even eager to go with that because you're, you're allowed 
something at Harbor Publishing that I find really, really vital, and that is you're allowed a kind of freedom. You have to be your own editor a lot more with, with, with somebody as busy as he is where it's a one-man operation, or rather a two-man operation, because Mary, his wife, who's a fabulous person, a brilliant mind, takes care of the, the business end, more or less, and so he takes care of the editorial. Well, Harbor Publishing uh, is always a mystery to people because they come up uh, having seen all the books and all the stores around the province and read about it in papers and so on and uh, they drive up the coast looking for a tall building somewhere you know and uh, they eventually arrive at our house there's a few computers in the back rooms but uh, there's no uh, great uh, hive of offices or anything and there's no uh, great swirl of, of uh, munchkins running around with uh, armloads of paper we have a warehouse uh, with my old printing plant in it, which we just use as a warehouse these days. But um, uh, it's basically um, a home industry. The headquarters is in our house in Pender Harbor. And uh, that's where we get um, all the ideas for the books. And that's where we do uh, most of the editing. Uh, we do all our own typesetting. We, uh, do most of the artwork here on the Sunshine Coast, although we have freelancers who work in their own homes. But uh, generally, we take uh, our books to quite a finished state. We take them right to the camera-ready state, and all that uh, remains to be done to them then is that they have to be printed. And we do about 75%, I would say, of most of the shipping is done from our warehouse here in Pender Harbor. So we do our own sales, uh, um, that is our own marketing and promotion. Uh, we have a network of, of sales reps who work on commission uh, all across Canada and the U.S. Because Howie is small uh, and, he ha and he wears so many hats, he can be everywhere. He knows the booksellers, he knows the media, and uh, he uh, is very involved with his distributor and with, uh, you know, various marketing plans and ideas and so on. He seems to be rare among publishers insofar as he's friendly with all groups. Uh, and I've certainly, I don't think I can recall any kinds of um, animosity or problems that he has faced with the publishers, with other publishers or with booksellers or with writers, which is rare among the, in the industry that they should be so friendly. Harbor Publishing um, mainly relies on independent booksellers in, in British Columbia to survive. Um, and we mostly contact them through a long-standing relationship that we've built up over, what is it now, 15 years in business. Uh, it's also wonderful to see him in the store browsing around and to feel confident that he knows what's being published by other publishers, what's been written, what's in print, what's out of print, and that he's reading and he's read the books. Today, the Canadian book selling market is, is moving into the big leagues, if that's what, what you call it, and is becoming more and more dominated by large companies who operate chains and, and operate on a chain mentality. And uh, small independent publishers like uh, Harbor Publishing find it increasingly difficult to get good national uh, entry into the book selling market because it involves going to Toronto and talking to some person who's very unfamiliar with uh, BC Coast history and trying to convince them that their chain should make a major buy of some new book which has been written on the Seashell Indian Band. It's regional publishing, I suppose, which gives it a kind of a, a funny, perhaps not a very appealing uh, label. Uh, but it really has specialized in, in publishing of the region, but not necessarily just for the region. I mean, the books that he's trying to publish or that he's publishing are perfectly readable anywhere else. But the label that he has is regional because he's drawing on, you know, specifically British Columbia. We're finding that increasingly we're being cut out of the national market by this, this chain uh, store uh, uh, phenomenon that's developing. And um, uh, a lot of publishers are fighting this by developing a more homogenized list and, and developing uh, 
less specific, less regional, less uh, genre specific titles uh, so that they can get into the chains and uh, uh, also get into the, the independent stores who are beginning to think like chains. So this is actually one of the more serious threats to what I think of as real, authentic Canadian publishing. It's getting harder and harder to sell that kind of product to the, the kind of stores that are now dominating the market. But fortunately, here in BC, uh, we still have a quite a healthy independent bookstore uh, sector, and uh, they're sufficient to, to sustain an operation the size of, of Pender Harbor, I mean, of Harbor Publishing. It makes sense that uh, literary-minded people do gravitate out to British Columbia. Uh, the, you know, if independent people have mo historically moved west to have new ideas and, and to be free, etc. I mean, it only makes sense to look at British Columbia as a sort of a potent example of that, that we have all these misfit people here who want to uh, start their own religious colonies or whatnot. Is there a lot of independent mindedness and the whole maverick spirit that actually Howie is very much part of uh, would would rationally, if you want to say, would make for a highly literate reading oriented culture. And if we believe these statistics, then we do have the highest per capita book reading rate, blah, 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 in the country. And so obviously you're going to get a publishing industry grow out of that with or without government grants. So I, uh, but uh, the more we get support for that sort of thing, the, the better it's going to get and the better the society is going to be because the society has to have the information about itself to understand itself to develop a better society. You don't need to worry about being regional. You don't need to feel that because you're being intensely local that you are excluding the rest of the world from understanding because if you write well enough and clearly enough about the local it's the same as the poet plumbing the depths of his own soul you'll find the universal in the local and uh, i think that in the best of the work that we've done uh, we've produced writing that uh, people in new york or uh, alabama or uh, london england can read, and uh, even though they've never seen this part of the country, they can see something of their own lives in it.